Hello, everyone. Have you enjoyed the sessions? Has it been difficult to choose which room to join? I know the program this year is sincerely outstanding, and we couldn't be happier to share all this knowledge with you. And now to continue our discussion, I'd like to welcome to the stage Carolyn Westbrook and all the panelists that will be sharing their views and perspectives on our panel, Language Assessment Literacy. Welcome. Is that better? Yeah, that's better. Oh, now I can hear myself, that's bad. Um, okay, thank you very much for coming to our panel this afternoon. Um, my name's Carolyn Westbrook. I work at the British Council in London, and I'm joined today by three wonderful colleagues who are real experts in language assessment literacy. So our panel today is going to be discussing mainstreaming language assessment literacy. So my first guest is Dr. Daniel Lamb. Say hi, Daniel. Hi, everyone. <laughs> so Daniel is a lecturer in TESOL at the University of Glasgow. Before that, he was a lecturer in language learning and assessment at Crella. So you might have seen the um, video with Professor Tony Green that was going on in the background. Um, Daniel worked there for a little while and did various projects on um, language assessment literacy and also delivers workshops and presentations around the world. Daniel's um, area of um, interest is in, in assessing interactional competence and also um, the use of la language tests for admissions and professional purposes. And today he's going to be talking about the role of assessment literacy in professional development. So that's our first guest. Our second guest is Frank Hidalgo, who is a professor at the Foreign Languages Department at the University of Caldas in Manitales, Colombia. Uh, Frank holds an MA in English Didactics from that university and also an MA in Teaching English as a Second Language from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And Frank's main academic and research interest is the interface between language assessment literacy and teachers' professional development. And today, Frank will be looking at unfair and or unethical practices in the classroom, um, in classroom language assessment with some voices from that field. And our final guest today, you all know anyway, but I will just introduce her in case anybody missed her plenary this morning. It's Dr. Gladys Quevedo Camargo, who holds an RSA Delta and a PhD in language studies. Uh, Gladys is an associate professor and a researcher in the Department of Foreign Languages and Translation, and is vice director of the Institute of Letters at the University of Brasilia in Brazil. Um, and today she is going to be talking about her experience with language assessment literacy in a course that she has been delivering to English language teacher education undergraduates for the last couple of years. So that's enough from me. I'm going to hand over straight away to Daniel and he will talk to us for about 10 minutes. After that, I'll hand over to Frank and then I'll hand over to Gladys. And then after that, we'll be opening the floor to questions from the audience. Okay, over to you, Daniel. Thank you. These seats are very comfortable, but I, I, I'll have to stand up for now for 10 minutes. Uh, so welcome to this panel. I'm just going to start us off with um, talking a little bit about language assessment literacy in the context of language test score use for university admission uh, purposes. 
So um, we'll start with considering um, a whole comprehensive learning system that Barry O'Sullivan was going to talk to us about, but also relating to the main theme of this conference, aligning assessment with curriculum and delivery. So we see that uh, in a comprehensive learning system uh, within different contexts, um, there will be three elements, the curriculum, delivery, and assessment. And if we think about the context of higher education, and I'm just going to use UK as the example, and I realize that in different regions or countries uh, there might be differences, but just take UK higher education as an example. The curriculum would be the content subjects, the degree programs that are offered by the universities. And then with regards to delivery, uh, it would concern, uh, for example, the resources that are available, the physical environment, uh, as well as the various stakeholders that are involved um, in that context. So these uh, would in include the students, and in particular, international students who came through, uh, came into the program through pr providing language proficiency evidence, such as test scores, um, the academic staff who would be teaching them, uh, as well as um, EAP staff, so staff specializing in English for academic purposes who might be providing language support um, to the students. And in terms of assessment, we can think obviously, uh, naturally, of the assessment of the content subjects. So that could be your term essays or written exam or projects, research reports. But also we can consider assessment um, to, to be consisting of the pre or post-entry language assessment. So again, um, the, the, the use of language test scores um, to start with and, and in entering that program. And on this basis, we can see that, um, and, and the argument is that these three elements need to align for the learning system to succeed. And there are ways in which um, these different elements can interact with each other, and there is the relevance of language assessment literacy in each of these sort of interactive aspects as well. The first, of course, is language support. So to deliver the curriculum successfully, the students need to understand the content subject in terms of the lectures, in terms of the reading, and in terms of producing um, essays or other forms of uh, assignments um, as part of the assessment. So language support or academic literacy development is key there uh, in order for, for um, the delivery of the curriculum. The second aspect is potentially the use of language test scores to inform curriculum development. And that includes the question of when and how do we provide language support or academic literacy development support to the students. Um, so potentially using their entry score as a basis to think about when it would be best to provide that support. Is it for them to study a year of EAP before they embark on the academic uh, programs or a more embedded approach or other approaches. You'll see that in um, the literature of English medium studies, uh, English medium of instruction studies. And also, if we think about the, the relationship between delivery and assessment, we can also use um, language test scores as a sort of benchmark assessment. I, I'm using the term from uh, O'Sullivan um, 2021's paper um, to inform delivery. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the role of language assessment literacy in professional development. So we've talked about the role of language assessment literacy in the context of learning system, in the context of higher education. But what is the role of language assessment literacy in professional development among um, academic staff? And we know that it's important because they are the ones who are delivering the curriculum. And how much support are they going to give the student um, the, the, their understanding of where the students are coming from, their current language proficiency level, and uh, their needs for further academic literacy development, it's all going to inform the delivery. So I'm just going to show you a few extracts there. 
And to illustrate the main points there, um, you might want to respond to that later on in the discussion. Um, based on the projects that I and some of my colleagues, as well as the wider literature uh, about test score use in university admissions contexts, we thought that there are a few key messages for academic staff dealing with uh, students who are com coming in with an IELTS or other test scores. Um, so first of all, is to familiarize themselves with what test scores really mean. What does an IELTS 6.0 really mean in actual performance terms? What are the students able to do, the can-do statements in terms of? Um, so one of the uh, program directors that we interviewed within the project, um, yeah, that quote, I really liked it because it, it, it's such a reality check. She basically said that, I mean, if you come up with six or somebody says 6.5, what is the actual difference? Can you actually tell the difference between a 6.5 student and a 6.0 uh, student? Other than it sounds a little bit better, a little bit higher, a little bit more proficient. Um, and usually at the time when they um, do admission selection decision making, um, they might be just thinking that because the other program, our neighboring program, has 6.5 as the requirement, so we'll go with that. Or if our competitor has 6, we might need to go at 6 as well. But do you actually know, you know what that entails and, and, and what that means, what kind of support you, uh, the students will need? And then the second very important thing is to understand the relationship between general language proficiency uh, and academic literacy. So again, uh, one of our informants made the comment that students who came through with an IELTS score, they are cert certified good users of English, but they might still need support because they might not be a good user of particular types of discourse, such as writing a full research report, such as writing a dissertation. So there is still need to be support for that. And they might be you know, dealing with completely different genres. Um, and similarly, a departmental admissions officer um, said that sometimes the academic staff feed back to the admissions officer and say, um, they, they, they question the language and dissertation supervisors commented that the English is not as good as they would hope. So there is perhaps a case for now increasing the requirement. But we need to sort of hang back there for a minute and think about, okay, does that problem come really from the sort of general language proficiency? Or is it a matter of knowing discipline-specific, genre-specific conventions of writing, the dissertation? So that's something to think about for the academic staff, not always attributing challenges or, or um, things to, to general language proficiency. Last but not least, we need to recognize that um, students who have come through taking IELTS or other language tests with meeting, meet, meeting the minimum language requirement from admission it's just a starting point for learning. It's not the end all for, for all. Um, so this admission officer said something really important. Uh, she said, and I think because just because a student gets a good test result, it doesn't necessarily mean that when they hit the ground as an actual student in a different country, that's probably very different from how they learn in their own country. You can't really assume that just because you've got the IL 6.0, you're, of course, qualified. There needs to be support for these people who you know are just cramming for the test and did well on the day, then came here and found that they were possibly out of their depth. Okay. And then um, the same admission officer said that, well, universities in general, they need to provide support. They need to recognize the need for further supporting this stu these students. It, the IELTS score just provide, it, it's just a piece of the whole journey, and it's a starting point for another journey Kind of like you've just passed your driving test. Does that mean you've mastered everything that, that there is to driving? No. I found that at the time I was doing this project that real-life parallel parking is a lot harder than parallel parking during the driving test. So passing a test is just a starting point, and there is a longer journey ahead. And we need to recognize that as academic staff helping the students. Um, Finally, just a few words about engaging with stakeholders. I think when we talk about language assessment literacy, and I'm hoping that uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have more discussion on that this afternoon, is that we need to not just identify what the, what the stakeholders are lacking in terms of literacy. We need to understand their needs, their policy context, and their values as well. 
In the context of test score use, it's actually an interaction of factors. There's the factor of assessment literacy, there's codes of practices that they can follow, but there are also institutional priorities. And um, I mentioned that briefly in, in the presentation before the break, that some admissions officers, recruitment officers might say that, well, can we do with lowering the, the minimum IELTS scores? Because part of their job roles might be to increase the, the number of international students admitted onto their program year by year. So when it, it comes job role deliverable on the one hand, and what is appropriate to set minimum scores, there is a real tension there. And we as uh, language assessment researchers or test developers need to recognize that, need to recognize their need and work with them. And the other thing uh, is about tailoring communication to engage stakeholders, which I believe um, you will have um, experience about and also things to say about that. And with that, I think I'll hand over to the next panelist. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Bom dia. Boa tarde. That's why I'm saying I keep being on A1 level in Portuguese. <laughs> um, when you read about language assessment literacy, you see the words knowledge, skills, and principles. Knowledge, skills, and principles. My thesis today is that we should put principles first. Principles, then knowledge and skills. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> but in all seriousness, um, this is the, the, the um, title of, of this short talk. Principles are major in language assessment literacy, I and mean, not just LAL, but assessment literacy in general. So um, I'll show you uh, some examples of unfair or unethical practices as they have been shared by teachers with whom I've worked. Uh, in 2008, you probably are very familiar with this paper, Dave is seminal paper on LAL. Uh, this is what he stated back then. Principles concern the proper use of language tests. That's my emphasis. The proper use of language tests, their fairness and impact, including questions of ethics and professionalism. So there's a lot of packing here that we need to unpack. What does it mean to be or to do professional language testing? What is a proper use of a language test? Then in 2012, Fulcher had this to say. Davis' notion of principles was present in this early document, although there is little evidence of it having impacted upon the teaching of language testing, either in textbooks of the time or courses as surveyed by Bailey and Brown that was back in 2007. Uh, so, of course, this, this paper came out in 2012, so it's been, what's that, 13 years? Oh, no, 11, 11 years, yeah, my math. You know. And, um, however, you know, I just wanted to include this uh, reference uh, for you. Uh, these two authors, uh, Atha Gabriel and Leah Plakans, they have this book and they have a chapter about uh, ethics and fairness and they include a list of recommendations for teachers to make sure that their assessment is ethical and or fair. Um, what I've done with teachers is I have asked them to share unethical or unfair practices based on their experience as language learners, as learners, or as language teachers. So they have been victims of malpractice or they have done malpractice themselves. So what you're going to see is unabridged things that the teachers have shared in courses I've guided on language assessment. Maybe some of these things will be shocking to you and see to what extent you relate to them as a language learner yourself or as a language teacher. So this one, is, I'm gonna come uh, this way so I can see it more clearly. We all gave a student passing scores so the school wouldn't get sued. So this student had an accident in the school, so one of the coordinators told all the teachers, give that student passing scores so we don't get sued. I used to assign scores on the spot. 
You look like a four to me. We have a scale from zero to five in Colombia. You look like a four to me. Oh, we need to give this student a score. Okay, so, so he's a three, just like that. A colleague and I teamed up so we wouldn't let a student be promoted to the next year because the student was just, you know, naughty during the whole year and misbehaved a lot in class. So, you know, uh, when I talk to my partner, let's not let this student pass to the next year. I knew a teacher who asked for sex to up a score. I've used quizzes to control misbehavior. Oh, you're misbehaving. Okay, take out a piece of paper, you're going to have a quiz. Once I criticized a student's performance as she was in front of the class. Caroline, you did a terrible job in this essay. And I asked my students to do a listening test in pairs. This, this sounds practical. I have 40 students, so I'm going to have them work in pairs. And then, whose score is that? At the end of the school year, I asked a group of 10 students to clean up the chemistry lab. That gave them a passing score in a makeup test situation. So at the end of the school year, we're very busy, and so we have students who did not meet minimum you know, standards to pass the year, so we're gonna give them a makeup test, and the makeup test ends up being, you know, go on, clean up the chemistry lab, and I'll give you a five, which will be our high score in my country, in Colombia. I've rushed through content and then tested it in a final achievement test. Like I had one week to cover a lot of content and so I don't know if they learned, but I'm gonna test it anyways. We have to grade respect and responsibility. This is part of the general assessment policy in Colombia. So you're, you're supposed to assess and in many schools you're supposed to grade, give your students a score for respect you know that construct definition is a major issue in language assessment. And, it, and it's an unresolved question in language assessment. So for teachers, it's very hard to score things like respect and responsibility. Maybe you can assess, but give it a score. I liked making students really scared. This happened to me like a, a month ago. I liked making light. I'm making emphasis on the past tense there. I liked making students really scared about an upcoming test so they would take it seriously. And this teacher was talking about first graders. Kids, kids, yes. So um, this, this is, uh, I have two questions here, one for reflection and one probably for action. To what extent are we addressing ethics and fairness in classroom language assessment? So that's why my thesis was, let's put principles first, then knowledge and skills. I can have a very comprehensive, very well-designed assessment system, a, a comprehensive learning system, but if I do something wrong, then that's not going to be so useful, is it? So think of principles as the foundation. If you remove the foundation, you can have a very nice looking building, but if you remove the foundation principles, that building collapses. And the other question I have here, how should we do so? What I've done with teachers is I asked them point blank, share with us unethical or unfair practices you have experienced as a learner or as a teacher. Now this is the end of my TED talk, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to share with you um, um, an experience I've been having for some time. And it's um, a discipline I've been teaching. So I didn't give it a title because I didn't think it was important. I just used the title of the panel. So I'd like to start by contextualizing a little bit. In 20, uh, 2020, I, well, actually, in 2017, I carried out a survey, an electronic survey, and trying to uh, find out how many federal universities in Brazil offered um, uh, courses uh, in language assessment in their programs, right? So I carried out this uh, research. It's published. This is the the article, it's in Portuguese, PDF, downloadable if you'd like to, 
to read. And um, that was interesting. Uh, so this is something I'm going to start with, showing you uh, a few numbers. So uh, it was a survey on foreign language teacher education programs in federal universities. So um, my survey, uh, in my survey, I found 141 foreign language teacher education programs. That is 100% of all the, the courses I found. 17, that's 12.0%, offer disciplines of foreign language assessment, right? 17 courses out of 141. And then 33%, 33%, uh, 33 sorry, 33, uh, that's 23.4%, uh, presented assessment as a topic in their programs, so mostly offered by education departments. So the word assessment was there in, in the, the program, but we didn't really know it was focused on or not. So we know they were mentioned, at least on paper, right? So this was the, the small study I carried out, trying to understand, because people usually said, oh, we don't have um, language assessment, teacher education, etc., etc. I said, good, so I'll try to discover if that's true. And I did. So based on that, uh, at university where I work, we started some conversations, and also based on uh, complaints that we heard from people that worked with the practicum. So uh, a friend of mine who is here, actually, Professor Vanessa Borges de Almeida, and I who worked together, uh, we started working on a, a program uh, and a proposal to offer to our department. So this is what we did. So based on the fact that not many universities, and again, I just looked at federal universities. Uh, by the way, there are uh, about 75 federal universities all over Brazil. So I looked at programs that offered language teacher education in languages, right? Not only English. So there are courses in Spanish, French, Italian, etc. So I was looking at all of them, right? So based on that, we decided to make um, a proposal, right? So we created, designed this discipline called Teaching Laboratory, Assessment in English Language Teaching. It's a 90 hours hour course, and it is equivalent to six credits. At the university where we work, six credits uh, are equivalent to 15 hours. So we designed this um, lab. Uh, we meet uh, three times a day, uh, a week. So normally, depending on the course, two times a week, and then the third class, students have to do something on their own. It's a very practical course. So we started offering this discipline in 2019 as an optional component. So I only had six students, as you can see, because it was optional. And so the students didn't know the discipline, didn't know what it was about. And then in 2021, we were in the middle of the pandemic, I taught this discipline online to 19 students. And it wasn't the same, because the, this discipline requires a lot of practical work. So being you know, together face-to-face -face is very important. And then in 2022, I again taught this discipline with 16 students, and by then it was compulsory. So it was part of the curriculum. So uh, what my friend and I did was that we convinced our department, our area, English language area, to include this discipline in the curriculum because we did believe it was important. And our colleagues agreed, and we had this component um, becoming a uh, a, com a compulsory part. So 2022, I taught twice, first with 16 students, second with 13 students, and nowadays, so this semester, I'm also teaching compulsory discipline, 19 students I have. Actually, I should be teaching them today. <laughs> I'm here, but anyway, they understand. So it's just for you to see that, uh, well, we started very small, which is 60 students, and then students, students started uh, understanding that that was an interesting um, type of knowledge to have access to. And then, of course, we had to make it compulsory so that every student that uh, had to go to the practicum would go through this experience, right? 
So what are the achievements that are? I was going to put difficulties, but I decided not to use the word difficulties. I put achievements because I think we are still in the process of analyzing where we're heading to with this discipline, right? We, we need to reflect a lot on that. But I just listed some things here for, for us to discuss. So one thing that is very positive is that one student from 2019 has focused on assessment in her MA in Applied Linguistics. So that student of mine, she was an undergrad at the time. She went to an MA program and worked on assessment, which was a very, very good thing. Then the 2022 group, 13 students, was observed for da data collecting by an MA student in Applied Linguistics, who is actually here today. I don't know where she is, but she is here, there she is. So she's an MA student, and she came to my classroom to collect data. So we thought this was very, very important, because it's not only a place to work on a, uh, language assessment literacy with undergrad students, but it's also a place for research, for development of other types of knowledge, and for um, deepening uh, applied linguistics knowledge, right? And then students in teaching practicum have shown more awareness of assessment issues at school. This is empirical data. Uh, we have reports from the teachers that work with the practicum, and my friend Vanessa, who's here, is one of them, that she's been witnessing improvement in designing instruments. So students are more aware um, of how to design instruments. They're more aware of what to think about when they have, for example, to select texts, to um, choose the type of task they're going to use. So we think this is an achievement. This is a very important. It's small steps, baby steps, actually. But for undergrads, this is very, very important. Uh, I don't know if I included. Oh, I did. So another thing we, I, I'd like to mention is that it's a challenge, at least in my experience, to teach or to work on language assessment literacy in an undergrad course because we need to adapt a lot of content due to students' lack of teaching experience, right? Because when you have in-service students, they have some knowledge, they have that experience that they bring to the classroom. But when you have students that have never taught before, that's another story. So this is one of the challenges I've been facing, right? Um, the other thing is time is short to deal with so many important assessment topics. So you have to make a very good selection. You have to choose what you're going to work on. So this is also a big challenge because we want to talk about everything, but it's impossible, right? And also, uh, I'd like to highlight the importance of providing a hands-on course. It's important to have time. That's why we have 90 hours, and it's not enough. Uh, I've, I've had students come to me and say, we needed two semesters. So each semester for us is about four months. So we needed more time for that, so that they could analyze more tests, uh, experience, and design, and pilot, right? So, it's, it's a very, very short uh, period of time for us to work with everything. So this is what I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, panelists. So we'll now open the floor to the audience for any questions. So if you have any questions, just put your hands up. There are a couple of mics floating around, so they will make their way to you. Um, maybe, oh, yeah, we've got one down at the front here. There we go. Thank you, Ricardo. Um, hello. Uh, hi again. Uh, I have a question for Frank, actually. Uh, as you we were doing your presentation, I got, actually, I, and I think a lot of us here in, in the plenary got a little bit shocked about the quotes that you got from different teachers. and. I, I, would li I know it's a complex question with probably a lot of answers, but I would uh, like to ask you, why do you think that some teachers resort to, that, to those unethical uh, models to teach classes? And why, because I believe it, in some way they think it's good for the classes that they do, do this kind of stuff. 
And I would like to know your perspective about it. Why do you think they do this kind, this kinds of unethical uh, teaching practices? Thank you very much. You saw a variety, and thank you for your question, by the way. You saw a variety of, uh, let's say, unethical, unfair practices, uh, many of which are, they, they, teachers don't have the power to have a say, so they have to do it. Like, you know, assigning a score to student, passing score. So in many cases, they have to. Or like the example of having to score responsibility or respect as like skills or content in their English language class. So they have to do that, whether that's institutional, regional, or national. So that's, that's one reason why they do it. The other reasons like, you know, asking, asking for sex, I mean, something as, as, you know, as shocking as that. It's just, as, I really don't have an answer. Like in, in, in that case, there are, you are lacking moral principles. And that comes from home, your, you know, general education. And, uh, um, you know, in follow-up discussions also, uh, there is this culture of using assessment to yield power through scores. Like, you know, I, I, I can control your behavior by giving you a bad score, and unfortunately, it works. You have a group of really, you know, uh, students who are misbehaving terribly, you ask them, you tell them, I'm gonna give you a quiz now. And uh, in my interactions with teachers, they give students the quiz, students behave perfectly, by some standard of perfection or perfect behavior, and then the quiz that they take becomes trash. So we are looking at examples of, it's not a matter of test use, but test misuse. And so that's another reason they have shared with me. And these are all very unfortunate uh, examples, which is why I'm saying, I mean, if we should look at principles much more, not just in the language assessment field, but in general. One of the things, one of the consequences when I ask teachers that very simple question, what are some unethical or unfair practices you have seen or done? Uh, they laugh like you did, but they laugh because they were the victims of those practices. And even more unfortunately, they perpetuate those practices. So as part of teacher cognition, I'm, I'm not very familiar with the field of teacher cognition, but that's part of teacher cognition. I, I'm, I'm sure, I, we have a saying in Spanish, I, although I have no proof, I have no doubt. Probably I did some of these things, probably on the, on the maybe, they, were, they weren't so grave, but I wasn't aware at the time. So when you ask teachers to come forward and share, something clicks immediately. Okay, thanks, that was, a, that was a really good question and a very interesting answer. Um, I've gotta say I was shocked when I saw that presentation with all those unethical points on there, but asking for sex, like, whoa. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Uh, yep, uh, one round here. Thank you. Hi, uh, my question is uh, to Professor Dr. Gladys. Um, here in Brazil, uh, there is the uh, latest course, which is the uh, equivalent to English language course, undergraduate course at university. And um, the, uh, something that I always think about is, uh, how is it that uh, those students come out in, coming out of the uh, latest courses here in Brazil, uh, whose linguistic level is usually very deficient, uh, regarding English language, um, will assess and evaluate somebody else's linguistic competency in English. And do you have this kind of a component to first of all assess the teachers who's going to assess somebody else's linguistic competency, uh, uh, the teacher's English le uh, level, linguistic level, before, like prior to starting anything else. Because to me, I think this is the, uh, the starting point. What is the teacher's language level? 
and so that this teacher will have an awareness of which aspects to look at when assessing somebody else's. Uh, is, okay. it, is it clear? I don't know if I will. Let's see if I understand your question. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so you're asking me, um, basically, if to what, to what extent a teacher can assess someone else if he is not that proficiency. Is that so? Actually, that proficient, so actually not quite. Uh, my question was, uh, if at the beginning of the course for teachers, this uh, discipline uh, language assessment, English language assessment, if these teachers, they go through some language assessment themselves. I see, I see. Um, this course I was talking about is taught in their third semester. Uh, so they come with some knowledge, they, uh, I teach in English. But what I do, and, and what I do is to focus on two things. First, uh, I normally ask them to work on tasks that are usually A2, B1, because I know they are B2, B1, B2, right? So. This is one thing. I try to make them work with something that is achievable for them. The second one is to not really focus so much on the assessment of language or linguistic knowledge, but to make them realize that we have to focus on the assessment of performance. So working with productive skills and also receptive skills. So if they're going to use uh, their knowledge and uh, assessment knowledge to work with performance, they can, for example, ask students that are A2, B1 to do something that they are able to assess. Right? So, and also language is not the only thing. Right? Uh, I work a lot with the can-do statements. I mentioned the unofficial use of the CFR in the morning, right? So I think they're useful. So let's work with can do. What can a student that is in the sixth grade, the first compulsory year, according to BNCC, what can he or she do? Oh, he can introduce himself, he can, okay, so how can we work with that? How can we design a speaking test uh, so that student can perform the simple task? So we have to, and also, we have people, in, in, at least in, in my group, I have people that are very, very good, people that are not that good, but everyone speaks some English, right? And again, it's not just language. We have to discuss other things too, right? I hope I have answered. Thank you, you have. Thank you. So we've got a question at the back there as well. Hi there. Um, since I was a student at school, I have been basically terrified by tests, you know? Uh, until today, I cannot hear the word test without feeling a lot of butterflies in my stomach. And I think this comes along like since always. Like with, I'm a teacher at school, when I talk about tests, I have a student almost fainting down. And I try a lot not to pass on this fear, this frightening that they feel about when being tested, when being evaluated or assessed and so on. So my question basically is, what can we do to stop uh, putting on this fear to them? Because as a teacher, that's not my goal. But every time that I say, okay, guys, we're going to have a test, students almost fading down. Can I? Okay, I'm going to, thank you for the, the question, very good. Um, it's. This is part of our culture. Everybody's afraid of being assessed. Um, I think what we can do is to work with transparency and ethics, right? Uh, sharing criteria, for example, is one way of diminishing fear. Everybody wants to know what you will be assessed for. Every time you're going to go through an assessment moment, we say, what am I expected to do? What's the test like? What's the format of the exam? What do I have to do? So that's familiarity. So transparency is a key principle. Right now connecting with what Frank was saying. Transparency, share criteria, share rubrics. So what am I expecting, expected to do? What am I expecting from my students? Do they know that? 
they know what they're going to be assessed for. So transparency for me is a key principle. And also trying to make people reflect on their bad experiences. Uh, in this course, for example, I was talking about, I normally, of course, students come with their experiences. They have no teaching experience, but they have student experience. And I try to make them deconstruct some beliefs and, you know, um, reconceptualize them, re, you know, rethink them so that they don't perpetuate, they don't keep, you know, doing what their teachers used to do. So I would say sharing criteria, talking about rubrics, involving students in the, in the design of the tests, for example, in the design of the rubrics. I think this is a very good way of diminishing so much fear that we have. Want to add something, Daniel? Um, I suppose just to add a little bit, well, first of all, I completely agree that, you know, encouraging the students to reflect on some of their beliefs or some of the causes of the fear is very useful. The other thing that I might add is um, encouraging a growth mindset. I, I can think of uh, the example where I'm teaching on the language assessment course in the, on the TESO program, and actually in general, Students are, are terrified, not just of exams, of handing in assignments, but you can encourage them with a growth mindset that, well, it's not just about the grade. Of course, everyone wants an A grade, but what can you learn from the assessment as well? What do you get out of the assessment? Whether it's in the context of language tests or tests in general, what can you learn from having performed the task, what can you learn from the teacher's feedback if it's available, try to focus on that and how can you apply that, you know, uh, in real life or, or in the next time that you're taking a test. So uh, a learning mindset, uh, a learning orientation to assessment is really helpful sometimes. Thank you, you're gonna add something? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So I, I want to start by congratulating you on attending the event and a shout out to all of the teachers high school teachers who decided to be here. I'm sure you're getting many ideas from the event for your own practices. And on that note, I think what you get out of this uh, conference is something you should share, not only with your fellow English language teachers, but with all of the teachers. Language assessment literacy has a core, assessment literacy. So you could do wonderful things in your classroom, get your students to actually like tests and the testing environment and all that, but what are the other teachers in your school, in content areas, doing to have an assessment culture instead of a testing culture? So take that message with you. Talk to your uh, colleagues in other areas because it's not you at the classroom level, it's institutional. And then I loved the, the, the analogy of trabalho de formiguinha, <laughs> little by little. And ants are powerful. Okay, thank you. So we've got a question over here and a question over there. So we'll go over here first. Uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my question is about making a relationship between assessment data and educational public policies. So since you come from different countries, I'd like to know what your perceptions are about how teachers understand if they do that they are responsible and i include myself as i am a teacher to implement an educational policy and that these assessment tools will give him or her data so as to assess how efficient this public policy is and further if it's possible, if they have this awareness that it also um, should feed the policy makers. I can start. <laughs> okay, okay, that was, that was a lot to, to unpack in your question. So that's a wonderful question, thank you so much. In, in my country, personally, we have a test like the one that uh, Dr. Carell was talking about this morning. Ours is a little better than the 10, 10 item uh, test that you guys have here. Uh, it has reading uh, and uh, that's basically it. No, it's not, much, it's not much better really. So it has reading and a little bit of grammar. It's longer, 
it's longer. But then the language policy we have in our country includes listening, reading, writing, monologues, which is just unidirectional talk, and conversation. However, assessment doesn't tap into those skills so much because the test that we have nationally uh, mandated assesses only reading and grammar. So, what do teachers discuss? These are water cooler uh, discussions. I have to stop teaching my students to prepare them for the test. So that's how they are giving feedback to the policy, to the language policy, because the language policy includes this big test. So there's a lot of negative washback, really, uh, because of this test. And teachers feel uncomfortable about testing, uh, no, teaching to the test. They feel uncomfortable. The walk we need to walk is bring their voices somewhere and tell the government the test is limited, just like any test, right? But the test is not giving feedback for the language policy that you are mandating. There's a big mismatch there, unfortunately. But, I mean, in uh, experiences with teachers, you know, in different contexts, we know that it's the elephant in the room. We know that teachers don't like the test and that they have feedback to improve the test. So we need to make their voices uh, be heard loud and clear, and that's a bigger discussion we have in our country, unfortunately. Okay, we've got five minutes left, so we'll just go to the last question at the back there. Hi, thank you. My name is Denise. Um, first, I would like to share with you um, my perception of things. And uh, something that I am really worried about, because we have been talking about enabling uh, new teachers on assessing, and we have been talking about um, new ways of assessing, and we talked today about international baccalaureate, we have talked about rubrics, and we also need to mention that evaluating, assessing students can be really subjective as it can be objective. Then my concern is, when we talk about uh, artificial intelligence and the way that we still assess our students, so we should be evaluating or trying to design assessments that can better uh, reflect their abilities. How do you uh, suppose we should work on the future of assessment when things are changing so fast. That's a very good question. <laughs> Who would like to start? <laughs> I'm sorry, are you shocked? You stunned them. <laughs> Great question. <laughs> I suppose the first thing I would say is I don't have an answer to that, but the first thing that came into my mind is, I think, reflecting on the, this afternoon's plenary as well, as, as AI comes into play and as um, skills, what skills do we need might be changing, then it comes back to the question, what is the construct for the assessment? So we need to constantly reflect on what we're trying to assess and what are important skills to assess. And once we are able to identify what we're aiming to assess and what is important to assess, then we can try and work out the relevant tasks or relevant ways of assessing it. So it's a matter of getting creative, but also systematically considering what are our aims and how do we go about doing it. That's sort of my two cents. Uh, I was thinking, <laughs> and I have to confess my brain is a bit slow by now, but that's okay. Um, I was thinking that maybe we don't have one future of English language assessment. Maybe we have different futures, because it depends a lot on the context. It depends a lot on where you are and who you're working with. So if you look at Brazil, for example, we are very big. So depending on where you work, you will have, for example, the possibility of considering 
technology, top technology, and depending on where you are, you won't. So I think maybe there are different futures. It depends on where each person stands and the importance this person gives to assessment. Assessment understood as having goals and pursuing the achievement of such goals. Frank, anything to add? Uh, uh, yeah, um, yeah, really quickly. Um, I think uh, that uh, the future of assessment depends a lot on the present of assessment. So when, when I was interacting with teachers, when I have been interacting with teachers in these courses, uh, something they, uh, they keep bringing up is, uh, I can do wonderful things with technology. I know how to deal with technology and all this. But my students don't have enough infrastructure. They don't have internet access. I have students who live in indigenous tribes who have no access to electricity. So thinking about the future of assessment should be about <coughs> thinking about the present of assessment infrastructure. But perhaps uh, uh, part of the future of assessment is teachers really um, empowering themselves through assessment literacy, really. It's, it's, a, it's a driving factor of change, of positive change. The more you learn about assessment, the better teacher you become, really. I think that's a really good place to stop. We're out of time anyway, but I'd like to thank our panelists very much for their very interesting presentations and very interesting insights. Um, and I think if there's one thing that we can take away from this, I think it's this idea of raising awareness among our colleagues, um, trying to make assessment literacy more of a mainstream aspect in teacher training rather than the kind of marginalized situation that we've seen so far. And although it is changing around the world and assessment literacy training is becoming more usual in training for teachers, whether that's pre-service or in-service, it's still relatively marginal um, as we saw from Gladys's presentation. So I think we here I think it's our job to, to take that back to our institutions, to try to raise awareness among our colleagues of what we know about assessment literacy, um, raise awareness of how we can do things better, or at least if we don't know how we can do things better, maybe get together with colleagues to try to discuss how we can get, you know, how, how we can educate ourselves, how we can improve the situation, and crucially, don't just assess in the same way that we were assessed because that's how our teachers did it. Because just because it happened in the past doesn't mean to say it was the right way to do it. So we need to think about the present and we need to think about the future. So with that, thank you very much for your attention, thank you for your questions, and thank you for the panelists. A huge thank you to our amazing panelists. And that gives us a lot to think about. Thank you. Now we are getting close to the end of the day. And to give us an overview and conclusions of this day, I'd like to invite back to the stage Cheryl Cook, assessment researcher at the British Council. Welcome, Cheryl. Hi everyone, I'm going to keep this quite short, um, just to say it's been amazing how engaged everyone at this conference has been. Um, some very topical issues around technology, around language assessment, literacy, and it's just been fantastic to see how all the educators um, and teachers at this conference have engaged with these topics. Thank you very much to all our plenary speakers and our discussants as well. Um, and thank you very much to the organizing committee um, led by Mina. Um, so just to close things, um, please remember that there is a haiku competition outside, um, which closes tomorrow at 2 p.m. So do enter the haiku competition to stand the chance to win a copy of the Future of English book. Um, and all that's left for me to say really is that uh, come ready tomorrow for another dynamic day starting at 9.15.
in the morning in this auditorium and uh, enjoy your evening.